Okay, so again, um, obviously I'm out during, uh, I'm still kind of recovering from surgery. Um, you were assigned uh, these questions yesterday after the um, after your test we took on chapter eight. Uh, so we're, we're probably working on um, Friday, October 20th, should be what, we're, what we have going today if everything is on schedule. So I want to go over these questions with you. Uh, making sure you have the correct answers. These should have been uh, turned in last night at 11.59. Um, so let's, uh, let's get going with it here. Um, section one, questions. So we're looking at post-World War I era. So we're looking at the 1920s, but more probably more prominently towards the early 1920s. So this is uh, you know what the United States looked like right after the war comes to an end. Um, and there's a significant downturn in the economy during this time period uh, for a variety of reasons. Obviously, um, you know, when the economy is, has been uh, transformed from a wartime economy to a peacetime economy, um, everything's changes. The demand for products have, have, uh, have declined in some areas um, and uh, jobs maybe are, are a little bit scarce as um, soldiers are returning and maybe their jobs aren't available or the economy has not dictated that their jobs are needed at this point. So there's a, a significant amount of, of, of a slowdown in the economy um, that happens you know, in the latter part of the 1919s and early 1920s. Um, the 100% Americanized Americanism movement was a movement um, that was um, characterized by celebrating all things American. Um, so you know, in, in today's society, we like, we like to think that we um, celebrate diversification um, and, and diversity of all, you know, different cultural groups. Well, 100% Americanism would be the opposite of that. Like they would have no appreciation for, um, for diversity and for the cultures of, of other peoples. Um, and this was a huge thing. It's, it's kind of a reaction to the, to the increased amount of immigration that's come into the United States, um, you know, following the war. Obviously, people who were part of the war, war, um, the World War One devastated a lot of. Um, Infrastructure in Europe created a lot of animosities amongst ethnic groups in some parts of Southeast Europe. And so there was a, a significant amount of immigration that coming to the United States, which is not uncommon. I mean, there was a, a significant in, influx of immigration in the latter part of the 1800s, early 1900s, but they came from a different part of Europe. They were mostly from Western Europe. This group is coming more from um, areas like um, you know, the former Yugoslavia or the former Baltic regions, parts of Italy, uh, even even parts of um, of uh, Western uh, Soviet Union, I guess, at this point. And so these are different group. They are more, um, you know, there's political ideologies a little bit different. Um, obviously, it's a little bit more Catholic driven in terms of Christianity. And there's also a significant amount of Jewish people coming in. So it's not the Protestant, you know, influenced Western European type of immigration that came in, um, you know, prior to uh, World War One. Let's watch this little clip here. Hopefully this is fun. Oh, in the early 1920s, many Americans were terrified that communists would attempt to take over the country. Who were the communists? Why was there such a widespread fear of them? In 1917, Russia was taken over by a communist group known as the Bolsheviks. So just so you know, that picture right there is Tsar Nicholas II, and he's being ousted um, by the Bolsheviks. Um, matter of fact, his family is, is um, kidnapped for the most part, and then eventually they are all executed um, during the latter stages of, of the revolution in Russia, the Bolshevik Revolution. Communism is an economic system in which there is no private ownership of businesses or property. Because the average American takes great pride in the personal ownership of homes and businesses, communism was viewed as a threat to the American way of life. From the moment this revolution occurred in Russia, there were widespread fears that a similar type of communist uprising would occur in the United States. Some Americans felt that the recent influx of immigrants from Eastern Europe, where communist and anarchist philosophies were prevalent, only increased the likelihood of such an event. In 1919, 
it appeared that many of these fears would be proven correct. A plot was uncovered in which 36 bombs were mailed out to important political figures, as well as prominent businessmen. U.S. Attorney General Alexander Palmer and Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. were both targeted. John D. Rockefeller and J.P. Morgan were also threatened. On June 2nd, 1919, eight more... So Rockefeller and J.P. Morgan are significant business leaders in the United States. Um, you know, we talked about them a little bit in Chapter 6 when we talked about trust busting and things of that sort. So they were targeted because of their economic wealth and their standing within American society. They, they were the kind of the epitome of capitalism, which is obviously the opposite of communism. Bombs exploded simultaneously in different cities across the country. Following these two incidents, the U.S. Justice Department launched a series of raids that came to be known as the Palmer Raids. This was an attempt to arrest and deport communists and anarchists who were seen as potentially dangerous. More than 500 foreign-born citizens were eventually deported. This panic over a communist threat became known as a Red Scare. The term is derived from a popular nickname, Reds, which was used to identify communists. Several other perceived threats also emerged in the 1920s. In April of 1920, two men were murdered during an armed robbery at a shoe factory in Braintree, Massachusetts. Two anarchists were blamed for the crime. Nicola Sacho and Bartolomo Vanzetti both believed in a form of anarchism that promoted violent warfare against oppressive governments. They were placed on trial for the crime of murder and were eventually found guilty and sentenced to death. There was much- So anarchy um, or anarchists are those who believe that government does not need to exist. And so um, you know, they believe that there's no, no reason for anarchism. And so that was a, a kind of a popular uh, political ideology during that time period, especially from that part of Europe where a lot of these immigrants were coming from. So that had that built-in type of stereotype that anybody that came from, you know, southern part of Italy or part of the former Balkan states or even parts of Russia would bring in that type of political ideology to the country, um, which obviously is a, is a threat to the way this U.S. system was set up. Much controversy and doubt as to whether these two men actually committed the crime but the frightened public was searching for a scapegoat to blame. Their sentences of execution were carried out in August of 1927. On the heels of this incident, a rumor began circulating that a major uprising would occur on May 1st, 1920, but this never materialized. However, on September 1st, 1920, a bomb exploded on Wall Street. 38 people lost their lives and more than 140 were injured. Communists and anarchists were immediately seen as potential suspects. Many were brought in and questioned, but ultimately, no arrests were made. There was almost certainly a strong communist and anarchist presence in the United States in the late 19-teens and 1920s. However, it is largely believed that most of the fear over communist uprisings was the result of mass hysteria and paranoia. Okay, so that's not an uncommon thing in the United States for people to obviously overreact to certain ethnic groups that have been identified as a reason for something. And obviously we had significant pushback against the um, Muslim communities um, right after 9-11, uh, you know, right after the COVID, uh, you know, shutdown and everything. A lot of, uh, you know, um, Asian um, people were were targeted as well as they felt like, you know, this is, you know, this is thing that came from China. Um, and so, you know, there's always that backlash, that overreaction that, that people tend to have against um, certain, you know, groups um, as we as we kind of, uh, you know, have right after a crisis. You know. um, in, in World War I, there was a significant pushback against German-Americans. Um, as a result, they thought, you know, every German-American, every German who was in the United States, even though they were probably American citizens, they were spies and, you know, they were loyal to Germany during the war, that type of thing. Um, so, yeah. So communism, as, as mentioned in the video, is um, as a system where you don't have any economic classes. There's no upper class, middle class, lower class. 
there's no existence of private property. The government basically owns um, all uh, of the factors of production. They own the, the production of goods, the distribution of goods, the labor and things of that sort. Um, so if you wanted, if you are someone who wants to own their own business, um, you would not be someone that would be welcomed in a communist state. Um, you know, there's very little um, communist states that still exist today, like like the way the Soviets ran communism. Um, you know, obviously China has certain elements of it, but it's not any way, shape, or form near what the Soviets had formed. Um, you could argue Korea probably has the closest rendition of that, but again, it's far removed from the Soviet system. Um, so what, what what's the hysteria from? What's this all this you know paranoia coming from? Well, the Soviet system did call for an overthrow of capitalism. Um, and capitalism basically is you know a market economy where you know supply and demand is allowed to kind of interact um, within the market and that relegates where the prices. Um, and so that you know that, that that interaction between supply and demand relegates the prices of goods. And if you have a product that is in high demand, you can typically offer a, uh, a little higher price. If it's, you have a product that the demand isn't really that um, big, then your price is going to be at lower. And it, it's just an interaction of those prices. That's what the basis of capitalism. Um, so in a Soviet system, those prices would be regulated by the government. Um, what did Vladimir Lenin predict? Uh, it was his predi uh, prediction that the workers would rise up and crush the capitalistic society. This is not a new thing for people to think that way. It actually goes way back into the middle 1800s with Karl Marx and his Communist Manifesto, where he kind of came up with the same philosophy. And, and in, in theory, it sounds like, you know, that could actually happen. Like, you know, if I'm an owner of a factory and I'm making a significant amount of profit and I'm paying my workers a relatively low wage and they're doing all of the work, right? Um, you know, you know, the theory is that, well, the workers will eventually say this is you know, this is not fair. We're doing all the work and you're getting all the money. Um, the problem is, is that the people who own these factories have, you know, either been educated or have gone through, um, you know, being a worker and now they kind of understand the management part of it, or, you know, they have the business savvy to be able to run a business. Not all people can do that. And some people, a majority of people are happy working in that type of situation as long as they're being paid a fair wage. Um, not to say they don't want to move up in their in 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 their um in their careers, but you know if if they're paying me what I consider to be a fair wage, I'm probably not going to rise up against them. So so the the, the communist theory um, kind of had some flaws in it in that you know on paper it might make sense, but in reality it didn't play out that way. Um, the Reds, as as mentioned in the video, um, was how people would refer to. Um, Communist people from communism, you know, the Soviet red flag, um, you know, that type of thing. That's where that term comes from. The Red Scare was just then in, here in the United States, there was actually two Red Scares. There was one in the 1920s that was the original. There was also another one that happened in the 1950s, again, right after World War II. Um, and again, it was based in the Soviet scare of the Soviet Union. So they're kind of related, um, had similar types of, uh, of, um, foundations as to why it developed that way. Moving on here to number eight and so forth. Here we have uh, A. Mitchell Palmer, um, who was the Attorney General of the United States. And, and that position basically is the highest um, law office in, in the United States. Um, you know, uh, he, he was attacked along with, as I mentioned, some other prominent business leaders. Um, and as a result, they um, did some investigating, probably somewhat illegal. Terms of you know um, violating some some uh, some private you know private property, violating the you know the laws of of uh, secrecy and privacy that people are supposed to be have within the Constitution didn't matter at that point though um, they were just trying to identify and eliminate people who were um, obviously I mean there's obviously some truth to this um, the uh, you know the, the foundations of of free trade and economics are being attacked as I mentioned. Um, J.P. Morgan and Rockefeller, they were, you know, they were targets. Um, Wall Street, which is where the stock market is, that was attacked. So there was, um, you know, a movement to try to attack the way that capitalism was set up. Moving on to number nine, 19, again, this is, this is early um, 
1920s, late 1919s. This is in the direct aftermath of World War um, One. As we get into the 1920s in chapter 10, you'll find that the 1920s and the latter part of it was a, a time of economic um, success for a lot of people. Um, but anyways, moving on. Um, union, uh, significant union uh, movement in this time period. Um, there's a significant amount of strikes that were that were undertaken by unions and, and really um, uh, communism and socialism has a lot of roots in, in independent labor unions. Um, that's where kind of a lot of that activity was originated, especially even back in the Soviet Union. Um, so there was a kind of a backlash against union membership. You can see on the chart here where from 1900 to about 1930-ish, so pretty much, you know, the first 20 years of the 1900s, labor labor union membership was significantly low. These colors all represent different types of labor unions. There's independent unions. The, the yellow up here, or gold, whatever this color is, um, is skilled labor. Like if you were a, um, an electrician or a plumber, um, you know, you HVAC, you know, that type of, of, uh, of work where you were, you know, you had some skilled trade as we would call it today. The blue would be unskilled labor. It's just the, the normal guy working the uh, on the factory, working the, the line, like a lot of your grandma and grandpas probably did. Um, number 11, uh, what forces uh, combined to trigger the backlash against incoming immigrants in post-war period? Um, there was a significant um, movement against immigration because uh, people were concerned that these individuals would take their jobs. Um, and not only take your jobs, but they might undermine the labor market by willing to be able to work for prices or for wages that were less than what you would be willing to work for. And a business who's trying to make money was looking, if I can hire this guy to do it for three cents an hour, or I can do this guy to want to work for five cents an hour, I'm going to hire the three cent an hour guy because I'm going to make more money off his labor, right? Two cents an hour type of thing. Um, and also in addition to competition for jobs, um, the Red Scare, the, the, Im the incoming immigrants were thought to be more of that ideology, political ideology of, of um, you know, anarchist, communist, socialism, things that were, you know, really not within the American realm of, of freedom and, and government, you know, type of democracies and republics and things of that sort. Um, what was the difference between the immigrants? I mentioned this earlier. Um, in the latter part of the 1800s, most of the immigrants who coming into our country were from Western Europe, primarily um, who were primarily Protestant. And, and if you don't know, Protestant is a branch of Christianity, um, and it's the most um, prominent branch in Christianity even till today. Um, so, you know, a significant population or significant majority of the population who are Christian are Protestant. Um, Post-World War I immigrants came from the eastern part of Europe. They were mostly Jewish, or they were, if they were from Italy, they were probably Catholic. Um, or they might have been, uh, you know, um, people who had, you know, other different types of, uh, of religious beliefs, but not the realm of the politically realm of, of what most Americans believe to be, um, you know, their branch of Christianity. So that backlash against those people were for that reason. Uh, what did organized labor uh, frown upon new immigrants? Again, they were willing to work for lower wages, kind of mentioned that earlier. And uh, as a result, Congress actually passes what was called the National Origins Act of 1924. And basically what it did is it set a quota on the amount of immigrants that could come from certain parts of Europe. Um, and so if you were coming from a part of Europe that uh, you know was identified as being like non-American, um, you're only a certain amount of people could come from that area. And I'm not exactly sure what that number would have been, um, but it was significantly less than what had been previous quotas um, early on. And then here we finish up number 15, Sacco and Benzetti, that was kind of set up in the video as well. Um, they were Italian immigrants. They were known anarchists. So they had kind of that, that um, stereotypical non-traditional American views. Um, they were involved in some way, shape, or form with some kind of a crime that was that was committed where um, a robbery, I think there was people who had been killed as a result of the ro robbery, they were actually um, arrested um, and eventually executed. Although when people look back at that case, you know, when, when lawyers look back at it now, 
um, the evidence that was available to the to the judge and you know to the court itself was extremely underwhelming. They, they should have never been committed, or I should say, convicted um, as a result of the evidence that was available. They were convicted because of the fact that they were Italian, they were um, anarchists, they were probably Catholic. You know, all the things that were kind of frowned upon really during the early part of the 1920s. Um, something that would never be allowed uh, today or hopefully not allowed today. But back then it was it was like a thing. It was OK. Uh, people were uh, willing to accept that type of, of uh, lack of, of justice and um, stereotypes and, and racism, really, uh, because they felt that it was for the good of the nation. OK, so that ends that. Um, so make sure you, uh, you know, if you didn't get your stuff turned in, you can obviously go through and like we've always been able to do, correct your incorrect answers, fill in the answers that you didn't get for whatever reasons, resubmit that and get late credit in that situation. So we should be good. Uh, moving on to the lead in, uh, you should be working on, you got that yesterday, I think on Thursday. Um, so continue to work on that. And then hopefully I'll be back on Monday, um, depending on how I feel.